Hi friends, Max Elage here. On this episode of the Corpus Animus podcast, training think tank coach Brandon Dorman and I talk about the new season structure for the CrossFit game. So if you don't know much about it, we'll try to fill you in on all the other details. We also make fun of your golf talking shirt. Yes, we also talk about Chris being pizza man of the year at Papa John's. And then we talk about how to attack the season based on your athletic level. Train along some of the best athletes in the world at the sport of CrossFit. To get a free sample week of our current training cycle, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN. If you're on the go and you want to listen to just the audio version, subscribe to the Corpus Animus podcast on your favorite podcast app. Can you accept the cookies, please? I like accepting cookies <laughs> in my face. <laughs> oh, man. I made these cookies last week with mm. Kinsley. They were so good. We put them in the fridge. Like, so I always cook them where it's like, you know, it says eight, 18 minutes or whatever. You cook them like 13. So Soft. it's still, yeah. Yes. And then put them in the fridge and let them cool down and eat oh. them. Oh man. It's amazing. Oh, <laughs> it's that's so the, I need to investigate <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, buddy. All right, boys. What are we talking about? Come today? on, man. You got a <laughs> yeah, job. Scroll down. We're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> you click the damn accept button and give us the dates. <laughs> no, click yeah, yeah, that. There we go. Nope. He's just Your website it. sucks, CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> you like well, my new, what, uh, How did go? What was the featured athlete thing? Oh, look at this hey, guy. Hey, it's Travis. Yeah. Why is he a featured? What oh, year? hold on. They just changed. What oh, year do you hey, look at that speed. Mm. All right. So tell them what we're talking about. The 2021 season schedule be be beginning. <laughs> be beginning, <laughs> beginning. With, with the open March 11th. So there's new changes in CrossFit, Brandon. Yeah, I actually was just talking to a couple of our other coaches here and ah. saying, I, I think that this new change for us is a welcome surprise yeah. because it allows us to have a true structure. Whereas like two years ago, you know, the, or the first sanctional season, I, I don't know about you, but I was running around Blah. like <laughs> trying to figure out <laughs> yeah. this qualifier's yeah. here, here yeah. this qualifier's there, yeah. this sanctional's here. Yeah. It was, it was tough. that into COVID. It was yeah. two straight <laughs> years of torment. I was like, yeah. what am I even doing? Yeah. Like, why, why are we am I even this? trying to plan? <laughs> it's so true. I learned like it, there was no such thing as planning in yeah, 2018 yeah. And, and really even last year in, in then the beginning of this year. But the, the nice thing now is having a schedule in place where at least right now, yeah. Castro said, these dates are not going to change. Yeah. Maybe the way that we do the workouts will change, but we know like March 8th starts the open or stage one yeah. and then stage two will be the same dates. And it's like, I can write out a template. I know exactly yeah. what training is going to look like. And then I can build that out for yeah. each of my athletes. You can prepare like a normal sport. Exactly. I, I want to make sure that we say well done CrossFit to getting this out yes. because I mean- Rosa came in and there was all this public outcry about getting some sort of professionalization of the system. There had not been dates released in the past on time and, and rule books and that type of stuff. And this year we actually got dates in a year. There was a pandemic. So I'm assuming that this level of professionalism hopefully will snowball into more so in the future. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we've talked about for a long time is making the sport more professionalized, like a true sport, right? Yeah. And one of the things that they've done this year is lay out a season schedule, which is kind of one of the steps, right? I think a couple more steps that are going to be really nice is having a rule book that is clear <laughs> clear, and set out before the season. And then like some true judging standards, which maybe comes with the rule book. Yeah. But as we build that, th there's only upside now for the sport because now we can legitimize it in a way that more money comes in the sport, more viewership comes in the sport and better athletes come to the yeah. sport, which I'm excited to yeah. see. Well, and maybe also more mass participation. Yeah. Cause I know a lot of people in the past were just fed up with the way that the system architecture was set up. And then if you get disillusioned or you don't like it, or you have a bad experience at some point, you just stop participating in an already niche, small community. So hopefully this is a huge step. So oh, great. COVID ruined my birthday last year. And now it's going to be ruined by the quarterfinal team. Oh, <laughs> no. Weak. Well, now everyone knows. Chris, you send will be your filming. presents to yeah. <laughs> Training Think Tank, one one four four five North Fulton Industrial Boulevard, We're gonna, Alpharetta, Georgia. You know, We're I get stalkers now. <laughs> well, I've it's on the website. Thought yeah, that that address is just abnormally long. It is. <laughs> it's a lot of letters and a lot, yeah, a lot of numbers. So people ask me that all the time. Someone actually sent me a kind gift. Thanks, Travis, for doing that last year. And uh, not Travis Mayer. Yeah, another. Travis. He would not send, <laughs> no, send he, you a gift from his house to here. <laughs> Um, and he asked me for the address. I'm like, dude, I have yeah. no idea. You're gonna have to go to the website. Yeah. <laughs> what did he send you? It was a gift card. It was to? Very, it, local wood fire. 
Oh, oh that no. was a good. If you've ever been to a camp here, you know. Look oh the man, car. it's so good, mm. and, and it was fifty dollars. So we had like oh. just a smorgasbord. Nice. If that's an actual word. I think so. I mean, that was a word. Yeah. I've heard it. It was I've heard it used before. All right, major changes. Open stage one, March eighth to March twenty second. Reduction from five weeks to three weeks. That's nice. Yeah. No, I think it's nice, but I also think that there there are a few questions that I have, and this is one of the things the conversations that I've had with my athletes is with a reduction down to three weeks, most likely there are going to be a few more tests than just the three weeks that we're yep. used to, right? So maybe it is four tests or five still, I guess maybe instead of saying tests, scores, yep. right? So more data points there. So I would assume that we may see multiple tests or like, you know, the 15-1 and 15-1A or 18-2 and 18-2A, expect a couple of those. And so that's a conversation that we've had and kind of planned in training now. And then the other thing too is, what does that mean as far as the first three weeks and knowing that there's a stage one, what does it mean for those athletes that are trying to get into stage two? So yeah. if there are multiple tests, are we going to do like a test retest Friday and Monday, or are we just going to do it one time knowing that they can get through if they're in the top, let's say 10%, if that's exactly what they take. So those are the conversations I've been having with athletes. Yeah. Hold on. So before y'all get too qu or say what you're going to say, I was going to say they posted a about stage one. And obviously the goal here is for mass participation in a time where the world is globally locked down in a lot of places. So they put out that if you need to complete the CrossFit open at home, you need a dumbbell, a barbell and plates, a plyo box, a jump rope, and a pull-up location. And then there's an equipment free option, which is probably, I'm guessing that you can't qualify for stage two if you don't do the actual equipment one, yeah. but that still allows, like if you have an affiliate and all of your members are at home and you're doing zoom classes, it allows you to still participate in the open. So I thought that was cool. Seems like a pretty good blend in a really strange time to try to keep the they sport confirmed going. That though, whether the, there's a lot of details still not confirmed out. Those were listed on Dave Castro's and CrossFit games. Um, no confirmation whether you, if you do the equipment free one, if you can keep going. No, I would assume that that's, yeah, you, you only go through if you have the equipment, right? That, yeah. Because then you have a set of tests that everyone's doing and then the yeah. top 10%. Yeah. That. I don't know how you would compare it, a barbell and plates, uh, assuming there's a lift or like a thruster pull up workout. I don't know how you could have an equipment, like an air squat pull up that right. is getting you through. Well, yeah. real quick, big picture. Cause I've heard y'all mention this in the office. Um, you have three stages and I've heard y'all talk about kind of how y'all view each stage. So can you do that? And then kind of from a big picture view and then jump back down. Okay. So that's stage one that, uh, what, from what we heard, the numbers about 10% of people will yeah. go into stage two. And then stage two is split as a quarterfinals into the different divisions. So there's one April 5th, one April 19th, one May 3rd. It's just one week long listed on the CrossFit Games site, which makes me think that that stage is going to simulate what we saw in stage one of the CrossFit Games this year yep. or the old age group qualifier system. So multiple right. tests, you only have the ability to do the workouts maybe one or two times with some repeats, film them. It's all over in one week. Then there's the next stage of that. And that's that does individual teams and then masters and teens. So that's like the age group qualifier. So, so that that's was the April, quarterfinals. Yeah, that's the quarterfinals. Then week of May 24th, May 31st, June 7th, June 14th is the semifinals, which to me is almost like regionals is coming back yeah. from the dead. No more RIP regional memes. Yeah. Um, where people qualify. We don't know the exact numbers. What I've heard is top five from each one of the regionals. And there's going to be, um, I think five in the North American and I think 20 total regionals. I'm not entirely sure what the number is and they haven't put out exact numbers on those or exact qualification numbers. Those people all qualify directly to the games. Then Based on where you finish in the semifinals, if you have not qualified, but let's say you finish top 10, but not top five, there will be a second invitation for a last chance qualifier June 18th, which then brings you to the CrossFit Games finals. So it really is structured like a season. There's like, all yeah, right, here's open it. mass participation, move into a quarterfinal, certain amount of people go to semifinal, certain amount of people go to the finals, bam, here's the event. Yeah, but we need an all-star weekend. Oh yeah, oh, that's true. That would be I, fun. I have actually heard that there's going to be some stuff in the off season. Um, and maybe that's integrating some of the old sanctionals like Wadapalooza, Dubai. Yeah. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with that, but 
there's discussions that there's going to be a more professionalized off season or a tour point systems, which I think would be really cool. I think it'd be really cool if you could get to a point where, you know, if somebody has been to the game seven times that they don't need to go through the gauntlet to get back every yeah. year. Cause if you want superstars, if theoretically, let's say Rich Froning after his four CrossFit games wins, if all he had to do in the next season was just show up for the games and not do the open and the five weeks of the open and the regionals, would he have considered doing a couple more years? Yeah. Well, hey, didn't like, they have early on in those days? Didn't they have like a, you get a buy? Yeah. They killed they it. Said, pretty, yeah. They yeah. said they were going to do that, but I don't think they yeah. ever did. They had, but I mean, I, I know they had a beef a year where you could just, yeah. If you were a previous champion, you yeah. had a lifetime invitation to the CrossFit games. I think they killed that. They killed like that, but then wasn't there something like you get the next year? And I don't know. What I'm yeah. About. I don't know. They, they announced it a couple of times and they yeah. said they were going to do special invites. I guess they did with Hunter. Uh, yeah. Was that yeah. What, that was year. 2019. Yeah. So like someone like him, but he wasn't in a sport. So it would be cool to have like yeah. a former, you know, a Frazier in five years, maybe he's done, but they say, Hey, <laughs> you can come, come back. back. <laughs> you can come back anytime you want. And that may be the legends. Yeah. yeah be, it would be fun. Hey, yeah. so you said 10% of these people are going to make it through stage one. Is that what I heard? Yeah. So I mean, that's the number that well, we've so, heard. Yeah. So I, I think there's a couple of things because that was kind of big picture. <laughs> well, I was going to say, give some context on yeah. our audience. Like when you think of everyone in our design program, all y'all's individual clients, how many, what percentage of our clients do you think will be in that 10%? Yeah. I mean, I would say that a, unless you're a beginner CrossFitter, which we do have individual clients that are, you know, yeah. let's say less than a year into CrossFit. I would say that the majority of people are going to finish in that top 10%. If you just look at it, so 90% of people are just freaking crazy, terrible. Well, a lot of people that are signing up for the open are just general class members that are doing three to four sessions a week for one hour. And they're probably doing a cumulative of like Man, 20 thrusters a week. It would be yeah. as high as 90%. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Crazy. So well, I mean, 200,000 men and women, if there's 400,000 people, it won't be that easy, but that means 20,000, the top 20,000 in the world move on. Um, if you're doing CrossFit on a regular basis and you have a structured progressive program, I mean, I told all of my elites, not that you should sleep on this stage, like, cause anybody can get exposed at any time, but if they don't, if they don't have confidence that they're going to make it through that stage, there's some issues with yeah. regards to their self-belief. I would say most of our individual clients will make it through that pretty easily. Unless like Max said, I work with some people that do CrossFit just for fun and maybe only do like once every couple of weeks. And the rest of their stuff is like bodybuilding. Well, yeah. they'll still do the open. They may not make it through, but they don't have any goal of actually making it. But I think a couple of things to kind of point out, the nice thing with this schedule is obviously it's, we have these different stages, but it also tells us exactly when like, okay, if you're 35 or 34 and under, this is when your stage two starts. And then if you're in the masters, this is when your stage starts in yeah. the teams. So it gives us as coaches an opportunity to be able to actually have a plan. And one of the things I would encourage people that are listening is know your goals and then have a plan in place for, if you know, you're going to crush stage one, then are you training for stage two? Because if it looks totally different, which we have to assume that it will, yeah. you can't just do all the body weight stuff in stage one one and then think in one week, you're going to be prepared for strict muscle ups, freestand, yeah. handstand holds, legless rope climbs, a one K row, any yeah. of those things that may come out. Yeah. I mean, I think just based on, I don't know, maybe some common sense deductive reasoning, which sometimes shoots you in the ass <laughs> yeah. in CrossFit because they like, like to twist it up. But if you know, there's mass participation, there's only those things, then open stage one is going to be relatively basic. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. No. They could still Probably have the most painful to be completely yeah, honest. Or there could be like a one rep max front squat, or there could be something that is a lower barrier to entry lift than a full snatch or yeah. a full clean and jerk or something like that. If you only know there's pull-up bars that takes rings out of it, it takes rope climbs out of it. And they say in their local gyms and athletes homes online for weeks, uh, for weeks one, two, and three, that's stage, stage one. one. But it's very clear on this that in the second stage, it says local gyms online, which means well, you might have to do that at an affiliate and need some additional equipment. See, that's where, I, you know, obviously we'll find out more information hopefully soon. Yeah. But just based off of this and the interviews that Castro has done, it seems like stage one is, I don't want to call it basic, but like true CrossFit stuff, yeah. right? Like the old school, you know, the, the named workouts, the benchmarks, obviously it'll look different than that, but yeah. that kind of stuff. And then stage two is your higher skill. Like we're actually going to get after a little bit more high power work, the stuff that maybe we haven't seen before, like the freestanding handstand hold that came out in stage one of yeah. the games. Maybe there's something new like that. And then you 
you also could think maybe they introduced something like running into it, even though it's online. They yeah. did that in stage one yeah, of the they game. They already set the precedent. Exactly. And I feel like once you set the precedent, you know, okay, well now you have to be training for this type of stuff. Exactly. Um, and it, it changes the type of athlete that could be successful. I mean, an elite athlete, like, Travis, Noah, whatever, they're going to do fine no matter what the tests are because they're already pretty damn good at everything in the sport. Like if you're finishing top 10 in the world, you, you know, you might not get a lot of media credibility, but you are freaking good yeah. at everything. Consistently finishing yes. there every yes. year. Yes. Too. Yes. Yeah. For me, the structure of this, if I were saying like, okay, I'm going to be a CrossFit athlete, this actually is scares the shit out of me because <laughs> stage one is like, oh, it's going to be all body weight. It's going to be yeah. all light. I'm Big and I don't really like doing that. <laughs> a gorilla yeah, doing box jumps yeah. and air squats. Yeah. I remember in 2011 when I competed, I think it was 11.3 was uh, like light push presses, oh, push box, ups yeah, and box, box jumps. jumps. Oh my and God. it crushed me <laughs> on the leaderboard, crushed me and crushed my soul in general. But there are athletes out there that have you know, capabilities and broad, I'll have all the skill sets, but they might not be good at classic CrossFit. Yeah. So you almost have to do some sort of self-evaluation on yourself. One, to get the timelines. So like masters, they have from March 22nd until May 3rd. So you almost yeah. have a whole full training it's cycle really five after weeks. the open. Yeah. Whereas the individuals you have from March 22nd to April 5th. So really what I conveyed in my like peaking is that the training cycle from March 22nd to April 5th is really one competitive maintenance cycle, yeah. right? Like you're not necessarily trying to drive fitness up during that period of time through the open because you're getting ready to compete in a month for the thing that's giving you the ticket to the semifinals. Yeah. So it's kind of a, like the, the structure is great, but it definitely changes if you're an individual, if you're an individual who's only going to stage one, if you're an individual who thinks you're going to make it to the games, if you're a team member, I heard the teams as well, it's going to look more like the team series. So yeah. that's pretty cool that it'll be synchronization in that second stage. Yeah, in the yeah. second stage. Yeah. And when it, so going down that kind of train of thought for masters athletes, so like in the design, I'm writing the masters division right now. And one of the things that I said in the first video that everyone watched was, Hey, stage one, obviously matters matters for a lot of you, but those that know they're going to make it through stage one, we're already thinking about stage two because we don't know what stage, if there is even is a stage three for them. Like, yeah. are they going to any on-site competitions or are they just taking, let's say the top 10 or the top 20 yeah. after stage two? So that is kind of their, you know, quote unquote championship to get to the finals. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, maybe not, I shouldn't say championship. That's their semifinals. Yeah, yeah. Unless something changes or unless something else comes out. And so our plan is, you know, we got to get through stage one for those that need to fight for masters and for masters. Yeah. yeah. And make sure that they just qualify. That's kind of the first step. But I think most decent masters that are doing something like an individual co or working with one of yeah. us or the design are going to be able to get through that. But then we got to make sure that they're good enough to qualify through that stage two to whatever is next. And, yeah. and again, those are things we don't know, but if we have a plan in place, at least everyone knows like we're going through this where our stage one is almost like we're still prepping really just yeah. for stage two. Yeah. Information I've heard with regards to the masters is that the number in week one, two, and three, and that stage one is 500 now instead yeah. of 200. And it resets and goes directly to the game. So yep. masters athletes go directly to the games. I've heard an interview with Rosa say that in the future, he wants to create an infrastructure where masters are going to in-person competitions yeah. as well, which I would love. And I think, I think awesome. in the future, I'm assuming a lot of this was inhibited by a, a competitive complete restructure of the organization and entire new leadership structure, which I don't think people would understand how massive of an undertaking that was yeah. for Rosa and team. Um, but COVID also right in the future if those semifinals can be big, like big venues and host the teams, the teens, the masters, or maybe even they happen over the course of two weeks where you go to one venue, one weekend is the individuals. And then the next weekend is masters and teens and teams or something like that. I think what is your thoughts on that? Actually? I mean, I would love that. I think that's what to be you, separate. Oh, oh, separate separate. Cause I feel like it always ends up being where like the teens and masters and team almost just as like the yeah. little slideshow. Yeah. I mean, I think they'd have to really figure out the, I, I don't think that, 
in order to find the fittest human being to get to the CrossFit games, I don't think you need enormous amount of tests. And I don't think they all need to be super exciting. So I think you probably could create a cool weekend where like, if one of the semifinals had a marathon row or a half marathon row for individuals that nobody is going to watch, but is going to be a good test of fitness, then you could have the floor that whole time dedicated to masters teams teams. Yeah. So I think there are creative ways to do that and maybe time up the finale. So like the, um, you know, the teams are finishing, then the teens, then the masters, and then the individuals come out. It would just take a lot of orchestrating, but I, I think that would be amazing if they could do it. Cause that's really what would create a sport infrastructure for more than just like, it seems like right now the sport is very set up for a very small number of elite people. Right. Um, well, I, so I think that that is one of my favorite parts about this new system is that they, you, after stage one, you get the top 10% that go into stage two. So that opens up the ability for a longer season and more buy-in from the CrossFit athletes to say, Hey, I definitely can make top 10%, whether they can get through stage two or not. Like they know that they're getting to the next stage. And so more people are going to be training at a higher level or at least more focused level leading into the open. Yeah. So this is a different uh, thing. I think we covered all this. So new worldwide quarterfinals, 10% of open. Oh, last chance qualifier. Yeah, we talked about that. The people who missed the cut in the semifinals, you'll have another online qualifier. What do you think they, about that? They actually, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I think from what I've observed and heard from being around athletes that are involved in these discussions, I'm not involved myself, but from what I've heard is that athletes are trying to push for a system that allows for more longevity and less individual pressure. Like in the regional system, if you got sick on that weekend, you're screwed. You can't get through. And that is kind of sucky. I mean, I guess it, you know, that may maybe happens in other sports too. Like if you got yeah. sick during a, the Olympic the qualifier race, yeah. like you're just kind of screwed. But I think that kind of opens up for, another opportunity for people to continue to gain visibility. And I think that just brings excitement to the whole time, basically from April 4th, I think April 4th or 11th was that first uh, quarterfinal. Do you remember? Yeah. I don't remember one the of dates them. on it. Oh, right here. April, April 5th, April yeah. from April 5th, almost all the way until July 26th, there's relevant stuff to talk about for anyone. That's a fan of CrossFit as a sport, yeah. which I like, I think that at least gives a uh, well, you know, media a, presence. It makes a real season. Like, yeah. we, you know, the NFL is kind of getting into the playoff time right now. And it's like, people talk about it in a normal year from yeah. August all the way through February, because there's something going, and they yeah. set it up that way. They make the Super Bowl a couple weeks after after so that there's just still more time more to talk hype. about it. Yeah. And even in the off season, like with something like the NFL, they have the draft at a certain time. So people are talking about the NFL yeah. and they have their training camps that start early. So they can talk about the NFL. It's like, we're, if we can do that to this sport, we can grow it. And again, for us, like as fans and coaches, it's yeah. just an awesome opportunity to see more and off like better athletes, but more athletes in general come into yeah. this. Sport. I hope we take it to the next level. When I used to work at Papa John's, um, you know, Chris then, was employee of, the, were you employee of the year? Pizza man no, of the year. Pizza no, man of the year. Uh, no big deal. Like a week or but something. I was there for five years and this was back before podcasts. Really. They came in towards the end, but the first couple of years is like you had sports radio. If you wanted to listen to something. And I remember I would listen to sports radio myself and then I'd go into work and these people at work would just literally regurgitate whatever the hell was said as if it was their own. Opinion. <laughs> wait, I can't wait. Who, who did you listen to? Uh, every, uh, it was mostly ESPN. Yeah. 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 Uh, but like but I can't Rome wait to our sports like that, like that yeah. where you're like, come on, man. I you, feel like that's you what just watched that morning chocolate yeah. video. And just repeated <laughs> everything you just said. Yeah. Oh man. Everyone has their own like little fan crew though. Right. Like, yeah, I, I was thinking that's what political discussions are like. Oh yeah. No, yeah, same yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, but people don't have political discussions. <laughs> that's a dangerous game. What do y'all want to talk about political wise? Uh, do you see this new hoodie that I got? Yeah, yeah that was such a good <laughs> deflection. This is a golf yeah. hoodie, Matt. Didn't you yeah. just say you can't wear it on the, on the, what do you call it? No, course? this, I bought this so that I could wear it on the course. Yeah. This is like the new thing. As yeah. Long well, as it's my cool, first, your my first question was what's the difference between that and normal Absolutely hoodie? Absolutely nothing. I bet you it's just like a, a corporate scheme. So they They're got like, you we to buy that to and buy. now you can't wear it. So this thing is like $80 if you buy them brand new. It's, I found it on eBay for 45, oh, which is nice. still expensive, yeah, yeah. but I mean, Whatever. Yeah. I look nice, Did, right? Was it used? Was somebody, no, no. It was, was brand new. Yeah. Well, so why, why can't you wear it? it? 
No, you can wear it. Oh, <laughs> That's what oh. I've been saying. I thought earlier I heard you say you bought it and then you were pissed because now you found out you couldn't. No, wear I was it. saying I wanted something more comfortable because you know on the golf course you're like all stuffy and you got mm. your polo on. I'm like, can I we need talk to- about that? Why do you got to look like a little uh, weirdo? I, when you so play golf? I, I literally just went to the golf store and one of the things I walked the golf course and my normal shirts are XLs and. I got made fun of by Travis and Andrew. <laughs> that, that, that was an XL. That was an XL. Oh I'm getting beefy. I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, hold on for the, for the viewers. Imagine like a skin tight speedo type shirt. Tight speedo. <laughs> <laughs> Delete this damn podcast to get me off here. Hold um, on. Hold on. So your XL was skin tight. Yes. Yeah. It was so oh, tight. Man. I'm beefing up. Uh, well, anyway, was it like a Versace shirt where you could just see your flabs and <laughs> I hope not flabs, <laughs> your curves, yeah, my, curves <laughs> my nipples. Um, my I got nipples are always I showing got, by the way. I got triple XLs and I look like a frumpy <laughs> bag man now, but I feel so much more free on the course. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to get made fun of no matter what too tight, yeah. too big. And now I look like I'm walking in like a raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I have this problem all the time because I'm shorter. So everything's longer, but yeah. my upper body is big. Yeah. So I have to get a bigger shirt. Yeah. Otherwise like my arms are, they get restricted. Tight. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's, that's super- why his golf swings. Not consistent. <laughs> <laughs> this shirt's just too tight. <laughs> it's super long and I'm yeah. wearing a dress basically. And yeah. people are like, see, I'm the opposite. I just found out my torso is four inches longer than the average of my size. Really? That's why, I've, that's why I have to buy tall tees. Huh? I, yeah, if, if I, I wore if tall I raise my hand my with a regular shirt, it's like I, I'm wearing a crop top. On, yeah, so. I thought I was like a perfect. You know the what's the Vitruvian man? Is the, the, the perfectly <laughs> proportioned man that's sitting like that? That's they, in my head. That's how I envision myself. And then as I were at the last camp, me is like somebody else was here, and they were like, "You have squat legs." I'm like. Squat legs. Does that mean I have stumpy legs? I'm like, fuck, I am a gorilla. <laughs> I have like gorilla legs and Just big long arms and upper body. Walking on your arms. <laughs> yeah. I, wonder, I wonder what proportions yeah. are more uh, sexually appealing. Appealing. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely data on that. Yeah. I, I think I Jonathan know, Haidt has done stuff. Like I that. know. It's s- not mine. I can say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know <laughs> symmetry left to right is like of the face is one of the biggest predictors yeah. and height. Yeah. I don't know the other ones. Um, it's gotta be back to the teeth, golf right? gear. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do you have to tuck your shirt in? Man, I don't know. Some guy at the at the country club I belong to came up to me and made me tuck my shirt Shut in. Up. I hate yeah. shirt tucking. Yeah. The first time I ever, ever went out to mine, I had my shirt untucked and he said, tuck it in. Yeah. And I went to the first tee and just pulled it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I say that's such a stupid thing yeah. to have in place. Yeah. I, the, I honestly feel like, talk about like sport reform, that they could make that sport so much more accessible if like pretentious assholes weren't making decisions about that. And there's a huge movement of people doing it now. Like people are preferring to go to, from. yeah, yeah. You huge know, movement. Okay. Like, hey, now hoodies are cool. Yeah. I guess that kind of, that, that the reason I brought that up in the first place was to dive off the political conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, I think that that's the process that we're starting to go through with CrossFit. Like for so long, it was just like, you know, I don't want to talk bad about Glassman, but the, wherever those rules were coming from, they're coming from the top. Yeah. Things changed on the fly all the time. And to have someone that comes in and restructures it in a way that here's our season, here's our dates. Hopefully they come up yeah, with yeah. a rule book. Like those are only good things for the sport. Yeah. Yeah. Even if the, like no decision-making and no rule system is going to be perfect. People will find ways around systems and whatever, but having them in place is what I think creates the professionalism and the willingness and understanding to like, let's work on this from year to year and come up with new rules and come up with new systems as the sport grows and as new sponsors want to come in. So I think it's been pre- pretty good. Back to this, it says return of the affiliate cup. That's because we didn't have teams last year, but do you yes. think y- y'all ha- have any ideas of where it's going to go? Is it going to be the old way where you have to be an in-person team? Yeah. I mean, they said it, uh, Castro did an interview that said it was going to be similar to the old affiliate cup structure, which was, I think it was three days a week at your affiliate. Um, you didn't have to live there, but you had to be there and show proof. I remember us having to show proof for like like three. Yeah. No, I, I love that. You like that rule where you have to show? Yeah. I mean, I think from a community standpoint, the super teams, like the people who are paid professional athletes, if you want to be part of a team that's dominant, just move right. to the same place. Like, and they, I don't really, they did that before. Yeah. Like, I mean, Mayhem is probably going to do that. I'm sure they'll yeah. pay and have people go out there to train with Rich and that makes sense. And they're pro athletes that are trying to build a team that can be competitive. But I think this, when they got rid of that, opportunity. I, I mean, I've worked with 
in a mentorship capacity or a coaching capacity with so many gym owners. And there were huge amounts of cultures that were completely decimated when they went to the sanctional system that were literally like, that was the architecture of how their businesses were built because the team of athletes was the best looking, the biggest, the most muscular. They're basically walking billboards for the community. The entire gym that goes there were fans of those people. So they wanted to go and watch the sports. They looked up to them. They wanted to aspire to be with them. Those people were teaching them how to get better. And even though they weren't training together to be with them, (laughs) to be like them. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you'd have like the sport version and then you'd have like the general RX version and it just built community cohesion. So yeah. when you strip that away, like, yeah, you supported the super teams, but you didn't support the 15,000 affiliates that potentially could enjoy the sporting aspect of CrossFit. Exactly. So bringing it back, I feel like was a, a great decision. I mean, you maybe screwed over a couple of teams that had people that lived in multiple places, but I feel like for the greater good, that's just like deal with it. And it sounds like we've formed our first team already. Oh yeah. yeah this did. is honestly one of the coolest things. I So it's three coaches and Brandy, who's basically a coach, Mia, yep. Kyle, Mike, Kyle Ruth, Kyle Ruth and Brandy. Um, I think just from a, from a longevity standpoint, they're all in their thirties. They've been training Still for young. a really they have long a master's time. team division. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We need that yeah. next. I feel like it just says a lot about just, um, you know, training protocols that keep you getting better for long periods of time. And I feel like they couldn't be a greater reflection of what we stand yeah. for and like, so I'm pumped about that. I think one of the cool things too, is that, so like Mike and Brandy, they now have uh, a little boy and Kyle has two girls. Mia's busy with work. They're showing that, Hey, even with all these other life priorities, you can still dedicate to your fitness and do well because they're going to crush it. Yeah. Right. Like, I, I mean, who knows how competitive they'll be, but they're still all really, really yeah. fit and super competitive on their own. And so yeah. it'll be fun to see how they balance all that for all the other clients that we have. Yeah. I mean, the expectations were moderated and I feel like that's always a great place to be where like, they, maybe things go great. Maybe things go bad. It's more about the journey and the process. Generally, that's like the most fulfilling way to go into something. Yeah. But um, I think if you just look at statistically, how many of these people that are, are not paid professional CrossFitters, because that's a like, I don't know, maybe there's a hundred of those people throughout the world that are like aspiring to be games athletes or getting paid by sponsors. Those people are taking care of their training and all that stuff. Yeah. When you go down from that, the people that are in teams a lot of those people for the last year have lost a lot of their motivation. I've seen a bunch of pictures of people putting on a couple extra quarantine pounds. Pounds. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to have to talk about like getting your ass back into shape, figuring out. I mean, if you're in California and the gyms are shut down, those people aren't going and training together on a regular basis. I'm guessing unless they're part of the people that are violating. So I feel like this is going to be a strange year that anybody that is in an area where COVID protocols were a little bit less restricted and who has just been training and building, keeping their community together is going to have a big serious leg up. Yeah, no, I agree. I actually had a conversation with one of my athletes last night. I was on a call with him and he's basically going through that, right? Like he just got a new job. He just had his first daughter and he had to take some time off because he, I mean, he's working for a huge corporation, working 12 hours a day. And we sat down and said, okay, here's the plan for the open. But like he had to make some decisions of how to navigate the training and say, okay, here's, here's a time I'm dedicating. But I think the cool thing for, you know, anybody that's kind of going into this season is again, I know that if I just kind of crush this stage one, I have an opportunity. So like there's more opportunity than, you know, 20 people make regionals and that's it. Well, then only for this tiny amount of people will there ever be a chance. Everyone's just doing the open for like bragging rights in their gym. Now you open this up to 10,000 or 20,000 or maybe even more can get through to that second stage and have something to compete for. And showcase more advanced skills. I mean, there was something about the open that kind of sucked if you were somebody that was outside of the elite, but you had all of the skills and then you, you know, only got to do, you know, some workouts, you'd have to have so much fitness just to get to, you know, a heavy barbell, right? Like if I were strong in 19.2 and I'm not fit enough and I can't do 125 toes to bar, I can't even get to the last bar. So it kind of, I think this system might allow for more expression of people that are not just well-rounded and good at everything, but still like competing in the sport. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. that's a, you, you are a perfect example of that. Like you have all the high skill gymnastics, like freestanding handstand hold comes out. If you practice that for what one day or two days, you'd be able to put up 
yeah, uh, an unbelievable a time. Score. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even compared to the games athletes yeah. or other things that are like that, but again, general fitness. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you do the open, then you're yeah. still obviously your top five or 10,000, but it's hard to compete with a Travis. Yeah, so yeah. having these multiple stages allows you yeah. to kind of express yourself in different yeah, it ways. It just kind of puts all of the sport components instead of just saying like, you know, one of the things in the past was you got to look at the whole season as the test because we only care about the fittest. Right. And that was that it was be like, Oh, we only care about Michael Jordan. I'm like, well, Michael Jordan's got four other players on the team, then another 10 on the bench and has to play against other people. I'm like a season is created. Yeah. A, even a superstar is created with rivals and other people to compete against. So I think this system kind of allows a lot of that awesome aspect of the sport being reduced and distilled down into earlier parts of the season as well. At least that's my hope. And the whole season is shorter, which I love. I hope that they keep that. Me too. You know, it's seven months. You have five months of an off season. I mean, I feel like there's some like longevity that opens in that. three weeks. Yeah. By, oh. by the time you get to that week four and five, especially if you're doing yeah. media and stuff yeah. like we do, yeah. it's just like, shoot yeah. me in the I, face. I honestly, I think, I mean, hopefully we'll see how it plays out, but I don't even know if you need that much for stage one. And I feel like I'm listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you're talking about trying to get 500,000 people. So like, if you look at statistics of something like, uh, you know, gym memberships at in January one, people sign up for new year's resolutions. It's something like 95% of people never step into that gym again after something like six days. Yeah. So most people that sign up for the open, you know, are probably just not going to have the, like, and you see it the too stick on the to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You see, it's like, you know, workout one, everyone, 500,000 <laughs> scores, workout number two, 450,000 scores, workout number three, a hundred thousand scores. <laughs> so so I think if you could reduce that earlier stage, you you might get, you know, give more people the bug. Like, Hey, you just got to fucking keep your shit together for two weeks. And it's yeah. not even two weeks. Cause if you do the first subset of workouts on a Friday and the next one comes out on a Friday, it's like, come on eight days, yeah. do this competition for eight days. And it's two days of your life that you need to do it. I think you, you have a bigger value proposition for the masses. Whereas, you know, the elite athletes are going to be there no matter what the structure is. Yeah. See, they also created a new division, the adaptives. Yep. Yeah. I thought that was awesome. I don't have, we have some experience, Mike yeah. has some experience on site doing that. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think it's, I'm interested to see how they set it up. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, they, they haven't really put out a ton of details yeah. on really any of this, but yeah. especially that I, I actually looked into it the other day and there just wasn't much. I mean, Castro yeah. mentioned a little bit of it, but yeah, I think Ro a lot of this needs to come out in a rule book. Yeah. Rosa talked a little bit about it. He's kind of going through and on, I mean, maybe the whole sport needs to do it because myself included needs to go through there. There's multiple different types of adaptive divisions. Yeah. There's like, um, a chair version, there's like limbs. So I think when all of that stuff gets put out, I think there's going to actually be subdivisions within adaptive, but I yeah. think that structure is pretty cool. I didn't see, uh, can you scroll down a tiny bit? Is there a quarterfinals for them? Yeah. So um, maybe they go in the masters teen qualifiers That's or what maybe I they qualify directly to the games. I'm not really sure from stage one. Yeah. When they talked <laughs> about it, it looked like they were together, but I don't know if there is that, that second stage for them. It's just like in addition to masters and teens that yeah. says a new adapted division. So I assume that just kind of through yeah. conversations, but yeah. I, I think, you know, I'll just give a shout out like those that have started that some of these other, you know, whatever the sanctionals were just like big competitions, like Wada Plus has done oh, yeah, that for Wada a long Plus. time. Wada Plus has been yeah. doing that every year. Well, you know, that's just really, that's one of the things that they've really done well. I know they, they do a lot down there. So other competitions that have done that to kind of push that forward is, yeah. is pretty cool. Our, our community in general, I mean, I feel like that's a huge inspirational part of the culture that should get spared. And maybe that part of that is, that there's a very heavy military influence. Yeah. I'm not really entirely sure why it's so big in our community, but I think it's pretty cool that it's now being like integrated. Yeah, no other in, sports are really ever yeah, showcasing. Yeah. I mean, you could argue you we could do like, it better and which is happening now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, there's um, like Paralympics and that type of stuff where, so there's some, but I don't yeah. feel like it's highlighted. Yeah directly with the main sport. Sure. Right. Yeah. They definitely have done a good job with that. Yeah. Final question. Um, we can wrap this up. So thinking about, let's say, take our online program, the design, take the average of <clears throat> the people in there. So like the average, uh, fitness level. Yep. And if you were or first, tell me what that is. And then if you were that person, how would you suggest looking at the stages? Not necessarily how you're going to train. You can dive into that a little bit, but yeah. just how to, how, where would your mindset be? Yeah. for that average You want me person. to jump in on it? Define yeah. who that is well, first. Yeah. I'd, 
I think there's the kind of the first thing I'll let you answer the question, but the first thing, this is the reason that we set up divisions, right? So we have an elite division an RX division and an intermediate and a master's so that we can address the questions that people have on the different stages. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think most people probably would fit into two categories, which would be intermediate or RX. You obviously yeah. have your elites. Masters is kind of their own subset of people and you know, right. cause you're just an age. So most people would probably bridge those two things. An intermediate athlete in our eyes is somebody that needs to get stronger and needs to develop more of the advanced skills. And so some people that are what we would classify as intermediate athletes probably can do RX workouts pretty often, but there are going to be things like muscle ups or handstand walking or freestanding handstands or 17.3, the third barbell for men is 225 pound snatches for women. I think that converts to 145 in that workout. It was either 145 or 155. Yeah, one of, the two. One of yeah. those two weights is the, is a third conversion. Like that's a pretty strong athlete. So I've, a lot of people would fall into the category of being mostly being able to do RX type stuff, but there's a couple movements or a couple strength things that they're not good enough at. So they're uh, intermediate. And I think that if you take that from the season and you kind of zoom out, that means that stage one and stage two are the primary focus. If you're on the more intermediate side of that spectrum, then you probably got to get prepared for those things that I listed out, the dumbbell, the plow box, the pull up bar, jump rope and barbell, and do a little bit more focus on the basic stuff and focus yeah. on the intermediate style training to crush stage one, to try to make sure you push yourself through to stage two. And for the RX people, if you have all the skills and all your strengths dialed in, like we kind of talked about, mm -hmm. you are most likely going to make it through that top 10% and you're kind of peaking for that quarterfinal stage and just getting ready to try to crush that and maybe make the semifinals. Yeah. It's kind of like a bubble regional athlete in the, the one system. thing that I'd say about intermediate, the way that I would look at it, if, if you're an intermediate athlete, the first thing that I would suggest that you do is make sure that you Buy some nanos? skills. Yeah. <laughs> Buy some nanos, please. Yeah. And a Are nice you sponsored by you? Yeah. And he's no, got they're in Walmart now. Yeah. Yeah. Let me pull that down. Um, I would develop all the skills first because everyone can kind of develop that capacity later on if you need to. Yeah. Not to say you shouldn't be building a nice base earlier yeah. on, but if you don't have muscle ups, you don't have chest to bars, if you don't have handstand push ups, if you don't have double unders, like all the things that you know are going to come out. And, and maybe this year it's different because of the restrictions with COVID. Yeah. But in general, those are the things that we're looking at in the intermediate path. Like we're really trying to develop your ability to be able to do muscle ups and chest to bars and all of these things. And then the RX path, you should have all of those skills. And then it is about how much faster you can go in a workout like that. Yeah. And then the next one is our elite division, which obviously is going to be looking at. Said, well, I guess oh, do you do them all now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can yes. talk about them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just going to say that's going to be totally different because, like, so you're coaching that path right now yeah. or that division, and stage one is just I don't want to. I, I mean, it really is just training for them, right? Yeah. Like everyone's going to make it through stage two. If you're elite, if you're in that division, you really should make it through stage yeah. two as well and get onto something else. There's going to be yeah. some that are on the bubble, but that they're really focused on that semifinal, like yeah. getting to an in-person Yeah, I mean, they really have until May 24th at the minimum to kind of prepare to get their bodies into peak performance shape. And I say that just based on the fact that if you just look at, let's say there's 50 men taken to each one of the North American regionals, that means there's 250, if there's five of them, there's 250 in the US. That doesn't include all of the elite athletes that are in Europe and Asia and Australia, South America. South America. Yeah, Africa, yeah. So if you're saying, okay, well, top 250 in terms of the U S men are going through, that's probably somewhere in like the top thousand or more overall men. Most people that are considering themselves somebody that's elite, I think should go through that. It doesn't mean it's a guarantee because you could get exposed and you know maybe you have a, a weakness type workout that comes out or you get sick on that weekend or whatever, you can get exposed. But I think for the most part, if you're setting your mind up to be a games athlete, the target focus there is semifinals and games and all the preparation kind of moves out there. Now you have to be pretty damn good to put your headspace there. You yeah. can't be somebody who's on the bubble of RX and elite, which is what we see a lot of times people want to jump up in divisions and do a little bit too soon. But I think it actually makes more sense to say, you know, swallow your pride. And if you know, you're 
you know, you're barely going to make it out of the quarterfinals, then focus on all the stuff that's in the gym and wait to develop your running and your swimming and all of that. Run that back one more time for the folks. Yeah. (laughs) If you are not elite or you're going to be on the bubble of elite and RX, that quarterfinal stage is going to be your primary focus. You might want to focus more of your time on the gym, getting intense, keeping your volume a little bit low, getting your strength up and waiting on the running and the swimming and the biking and the strong man and the other skills. You heard the man. So yeah. that's be, hard to do, yeah. especially well, as a, a athlete that wants to make yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, the truth is like your, your gift is getting to the semifinals at that point. Like we used to have people that were like, I just want to make regionals. Right. It's a totally different mind state than somebody that's like, I want to win regionals. Exactly. And if you're going to win regionals, you're not really that worried about yeah. getting there. And can we also say that there is a large gap still not to like hurt anybody's feelings, yeah, yeah. but there's a, the gap between the true like top yeah. 20 in the world. And then those that are making sanctions is still very large. So yeah. that's also some ground you have yeah, to yeah. make up. But the first step yeah. is getting to that yeah. in-person competition. I mean, the gap in performance between somebody that's a top 10 games athlete in the world and a 500th place in the world athlete is probably almost as wide as that 500th place person and me in the 10,000 yes. plus range. And that that's, second place person in Frazier. I mean, well, that's, that's, so I mean, that's that gap perfect maybe example. is even as big. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, it's huge. Look at the, the, and obviously Frazier just crushed these workouts Ugh, this year, but the so stage one workouts. Frazier division. Yeah. yeah just one get person. out of the damn competition. He beat everyone by a minute in a four minute workout yeah. by 25%. Yeah. Everyone, so, everyone, everyone, everyone. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. you know, the, and that's also the, the gap that's seen because we've yeah. kind of pulled that data out. So it's just a way for people to start thinking thinking about it and actually having realistic expectations, like you said at the front end of this conversation, yeah. if you do that, you're going to have a more enjoyable season and you may surprise yourself. Yeah. Anything else, Chris? I love surprises. Me um, too. Uh, I don't know. As of filming this today, it's a Tuesday. Yesterday was Monday, the beginning of Is our- Is that how weeks work? <laughs> open <laughs> peaking What's cycle. after Tuesday? <laughs> it, uh, did the elites put up any big numbers on that? Uh, yeah, I saw, th- I saw 300 pound snatch yesterday. I think Man. 180 was our biggest female. I'm going to check the leaderboard right now I have my time blocked off to do it after this podcast and you put me on the damn spot, but I'll open it up. Ooh, Dylan Pettit at a three Oh five. Oh, that's today. I was like, what the hell? I was about to say, was geez, like, no, he didn't do that last on? week. <laughs> uh, Dylan's pretty strong, but he no, is, he he's a gorilla too. He and he that. can breathe, man. That, yeah. It's so impressive. All right. Luke McLennan snatched 300 on the male side and Josh Gervais was behind him at two eighty five, And on the female side, Sarah Sigmund's daughter at 180 pounds and Nicole McGinney at 175 right behind her. So those Man, are the Nicole biggest numbers. We see. Strong, Do we have she anybody in the design with the first name G? Cause D could be for Dylan S for Sarah G for whoever N for Noah. I, oh, DSGN. I was like, what the, it's like, that's not <laughs> alphabetical. <laughs> God, I'm dumb sometimes. Just going to sit over <laughs> here. <laughs> Kick me off this podcast. <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. If you want a free sample week of that peaking cycle, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN. Well done. Follow Brandon on Instagram. <laughs> we post nothing. <laughs> nothing. I just deleted I all my Follow posts. Max on I Instagram. He deleted media. everything. I'm going to come back. Try Maybe. to find mine if you're lucky. <laughs>